O Lord, may the words of my mouth and meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. You are our rock and you are our redeemer. Amen. March 2010. It was during the height of the violence in Juarez when the doubts were raised about our church's participation in the mission project that had been, we had been braving since 2004. It was the year that the government sent out this warning to its spring breakers that Mexico was the place they really ought not to be, a warning that the University of Illinois also publicized. The local newspaper, who I thought sent out a reporter to interview me to talk about our church's commitment and success in Juarez, would spin the article suggesting that the pastor in the interview was ignoring the warnings and leading people to slaughter. Phone calls and emails from the community and our church's hierarchy would follow. But we went, anyway. We even sat in El Paso the night before crossing and discussed the risks and voted on whether to go across and the vote was unanimous to go across and we did. We built two houses without threat to our safety. At the conclusion of our trip, as we sat in the airport to return, one of the participants and I were discussing the trip, sharing in laughter, and then I asked him why. Why did, why did he go despite the university suggesting he not go? He was a student. Why did he have such a, a good time at night in the team house and not seem to care about what was happening outside of the community? And he answered, well, Pastor Brad, I see it this way. Every night you would go up to your room at the team house and you'd close the door with your headphones on and you'd be reading the Bible. So if my pastor was praying for us, listening to Christian music and reading his Bible, why should I be afraid? Why well, didn't have the heart to tell him I was actually reading scripture to plan my funeral? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> kidding. <laughs> what I could not tell him on that day that we were returning home and celebrating a successful trip was that I was worried the whole week. Worried about our safety, some, but even more worried about the repercussions on me when I would return home. Sometimes we make up what we need to hear in the moment, and whether what we make up is the truth or, or not may not matter. Because what we make up may be more comforting than the truth. One of the first funerals I ever performed was a young woman in her 40s who took her own life. Now I was forewarned on my way home by one of my mentors to prepare myself because people will say the darndest things in times of loss. And he was right. I say, as, as I sat there in the living room with the deceased, <coughs> sat in the living room of the deceased with the husband she left behind. People came through the house all day, offering their sympathy, and yet out of their mouths came words that most did not realize hurt the grieving more than helped him. God just needed another angel. I don't think I believe that. God's in, God of infinite power has plenty of angels. God must have needed her more. Really? Because I am sure we needed her here. It's God's will. Hmm. It's God's will that someone would suffer so much that they would hurt themselves this badly. I disagree. We want answers for ourselves, or we need answers to explain what we believe. When confronted with such bad things, we want an answer, and whether the answer is true or not may not matter because an answer feels better. Than not knowing. We want to know why do bad things happen? And how can I prevent the same thing from happening to me and the people that I love? And any answer these questions will do, just as long as there is an answer. And the more an answer allows me to believe the same thing won't happen to me, the better. Because again, what we make up may be more comforting than the truth. Kids say the darndest thing, they might have been a TV show in the past, but the people say and do the darndest things as a fact through time. As Lent begins this week, Lent, the season before Easter, where we remember the 40 days Jesus spent in temptation and trial, and then began his mission to the cross, a journey that will call people to discipleship and commitment, and we'll talk about love and peace in our lives, and we'll end with a sacrifice on the cross. 
This is meant to be an intense 40 days of self-examination and reflecting on how we live out our faith and how willing are we to go all the way to the cross with Christ, yet also, this is meant to be a time of growth, how we can study more, worship more, pray more, grow closer to God so that our mission will be even more clear. As Wes and I talked about where we wanted to go with this Lent, it made sense to us, and we were preaching the same theme in both worship services throughout the next six weeks. Given that Lent, what Lent means to the church, why not preach on the seven last words of Christ? Also called the sayings of Christ. The sayings of Jesus on the cross are seven expressions traditionally attributed to Jesus during his crucifixion. The Bible says he hung there for six hours and probably said far more than this. And these were the words remembered by the church as drawn by the Gospels. They each have special meaning, which we will dive into each week. Today, we begin with the words, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Now, interesting to note here, if you have a study Bible, you can look in your study Bible, and there'll be a note at the bottom of this verse suggesting that this was not part of Luke's original manuscript. But these words were added later, perhaps not even until the 4th century. I mean, certainly when we do biblical scholarship, we want to look at the earliest manuscripts for authenticity. Yet these words of forgiveness do not appear? Why? Perhaps because the radical nature of forgiveness. The forgiveness that Jesus spoke of is not like that of the sacrifice of the Old Testament or the sacrificial times of his day. Where you go and you make your sacrifice in the temple and you walk away feeling good about yourself. But this is unconditional forgiveness. Unconditional forgiveness was foreign to them in the first century and also yet foreign to us in the 21st century. As he, it is hard for us to hear these words of Jesus from the cross as he has been beaten, mocked, stripped, spat upon, and nailed to a piece of wood and left to die. Oh, Father, forgive them. For they do not know what they are doing. Really? Because if that was us, we would have other thoughts and emotions. Remember your feelings on 9 11, 2001. Did you pray, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing? Of course not. Because that, because of what we have been taught all these years, is that forgiveness is conditional. And yet, this late addition to Scripture that we, that we find important, though challenging to our own faith, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing, is consistent with how Jesus, of how we know Jesus. I mean, it's helpful to consider how Jesus responds to his own crucifixion. He doesn't offer a word in his own defense. He doesn't condemn Herod or Pilate or the Jewish leaders. He doesn't proclaim his own innocence. He doesn't turn against God. He doesn't attack his attackers. He doesn't attempt to save himself. He doesn't blame anyone, though there were many to blame. Instead, he prays. He prays, Father, forgive them. They do not know what they're doing. Yet also the life of Christ is no different than his crucifixion. We're going to turn to the Gospel of John this morning. Chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. It might just fall on the screen behind me. But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn, he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered around him and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law of Moses, the law, in the law Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? And we're using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first until Jesus was left with the woman standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked the woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life 
our sin. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. One of these treasured stories where we hear the words or draw the words, he who is without sin and cast the first stone. Definitely a line I heard repeatedly in my childhood by my mother. Do you ever wonder what Jesus was drawing in the sand? Think about that line. One of those great mysteries. And here's another interesting note about this text. If you open your study Bible, the same thing by John 8 applies to Luke 23. It was added later to John's original manuscript. Why? Here we are with Jesus, with this woman caught in the act of adultery. She could, she should be stoned to death, right? And it's the law of Moses. This is what we do. <clears throat> We follow the law when it's convenient to us, by the way. We follow the law. And now Jesus, isn't this what we were supposed to do? But Jesus doesn't buy it. Obviously a test to trap him, to find reason to discredit him. But his response is in line with everything we know about him and consistent with his whole life, even on the cross. I do not condemn you. Go on your way and sin no more. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. Now, if you were to apply those words of Jesus on the cross to this text in John 8, who would that be directed at in this text? Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. Is, is he talking about the woman here? Perhaps directed <laughs> at the stoners. You know, the leaders who are blind to their own sin of casting judgment, carrying their stone in anger. There are a vast number of other readings in the Gospels where Jesus is teaching this new kind of forgiveness. One that is unconditional as another way of looking at it. It is the idea of Jesus, the idea that Jesus teaches of forgiveness is the idea of distributive justice. Most of us know what retributive justice is. is many of us hold that mindset that God's going to strike down our enemies with lightning bolts or punishment. Or that we're going to get revenge for the thing that's been taken, done upon us. We're going to take justice in our own hands. If you've been wrong, do you know what I'm talking about? The anger, the fury that you feel when someone has done some harm to you. That is not the person of Jesus. For him, it's about distributive justice. Where it's not about who has the upper hand. Forgiveness cannot be deserved as if, if we, or Christ for that matter, can balance the equation, make up or arithmetic work, and, and keep everything clinically balanced. Reduction of God's forgiveness to a kind of trick transaction is abuse itself, and yet forgiveness is very costly. It is costly to the one who forgives because he's giving up something. It's costly to the one forgiven. It's costly because it entails acknowledging the need of forgiveness, and that means turning away from the lies it means allowing oneself to be vulnerable, allowing oneself to be loved. It means facing up to oneself. Some forgiveness demands a degree of restitution, not as the repayment for past wrongs, which can mostly never be repaid, that's retribution. But injustice and loss must be acknowledged and open the door for further reconciliation. See, forgiveness is far from naive. But it is facing realities and doing something which changes the equation. Otherwise, all we do is perpetuate the hatred or the injustice or the violence over and over and over. And Jesus saved the people to lay down their stones, to lay down their anger or hatred. And he says to the woman, go on a different way in life. And Jesus on a cross says, Father, forgive them. End this cycle of violence. End this need to put someone to death. End this need for revenge. I do not condemn you. Father, forgive him. Same matter. John 8, Luke 23. He had two texts that were led later because perhaps first century readers couldn't grasp the concept. The forgiveness runs that deep. Now mind you, forgiveness does not mean condoning what has been done. That Bishop Desmond Tutu explained that forgiveness, he explained forgiveness as taking what happened seriously and not minimizing it, drawing out the sting in the memory that threatens to poison our entire existence. And forgiveness, he continues, involves trying to understand the, perpe the, the perpetrators and so have empathy. 
and stuff. Have empathy to try to stand in their shoes and appreciate the sort of pressures and influences that might have conditioned them. By forgiveness, he, included, he concludes, we are saying here is a chance to make a new beginning. If you've been betrayed, if you've been spat upon, if you've been walked upon, if you've been judged incorrectly, you know how hard this is to hear. So what we do have control is of ourselves. How we respond to things. Whether to allow anger and regret or wrath or revenge eat us up. Because I'm telling you, tell you, that's what it will do. At the heart of this for us is how we respond in the first place. We say and do the worst things when we feel threatened. Like trying to have the answers for bad things happening, we say things and hope with hopes of believing them or finding comfort. So when we feel threatened, or our way of life feels threatened, or our values feel threatened, we say and do the worst things to others. For Jesus, the fact that his, this unconditional forgiveness perhaps missed early manuscripts because it threatened a whole system of retributive justice. And that's this evidence of the power of his ministry and the message of his life. He showed up at the temple, the center of religious life, and taught that we need to stop judging and start forgiving, to stop fighting and start loving, to stop segregating the poor out and start building a community. And we fought against that. Think about that for a second. What about forgiveness and love and building community is something that we should fight against? The woman caught in adultery. I mean, do you notice in this text that the man who she was supposedly sleeping with was never brought in. You notice that? Perhaps one of the men carrying the stones was one of the men that she'd been with. But Jesus challenged their way of life and spoke of justice and grace. I do not condemn you and neither should they. He threatened their way of life and they responded with accusations of blasphemy and shouts, crucify him. Crucify him. When we feel threatened, when our mortality or our values are at stake, we say the darkest of things and do the worst of things. And Jesus' response was not to meet the threat with more feelings of being threatened or a call for God to strike them all down. No. Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. End the cycle. Forgive them. Postpone the judgment. No condemnation. See, for Jesus, his mission, for his mission and his purpose to be clear, for, he, for his sacrifice to be made, he had to clear the way of his heart of such desire of revenge and power. Think about that. If he went to the grave with such revenge and anger, those things would have held him down. That's what I believe, and perhaps for us, we have to begin to let go as well. We can only control our response. What we judge in others, dear friends, and this is the text that kind of draws us with, with the, the woman. And you think about the other instances of judgment in which we cast doubt upon the lives of others. What we judge in others is what we despise in ourselves. Jesus cleaned that slate. You don't realize what you're doing. As Bishop Tutu says, you know, you walk in their shoes and understand their pressures, understand their culture, and understand their traditions. And then you start to get the heart of things. We have to be clear, dear friends, about who we are and where our security lies and know that grace covers all of us. We say and do the oddest of things when we feel threatened. I mean, I was thinking about this this past week, watching, watching the, the, the Lincoln movie that came out a few years ago. And the whole notion of slavery and the hatred towards President Lincoln from the South because he threatened their way of life. He threatened their economy. Looking for a good movie to watch this week? Watch the movie 12 Years as a Slave. You come to understand the anger that takes place and the desire for revenge and the notion of grace at the end. 
we have to be very clear about who we are, what our mission is, and to know where our security is. Lent is a time of self-examination. Time for us to clear the path of who we are called to be. And forgiveness is a key part of that. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes, that.